So my name is Grace, and I'm a data scientist at Uber. And today I'm going to be talking about turning fails into wins. So when I say fails, in the context of this talk, I'm referring to failed experiments. So how many of us have run experiments in this room? OK, a fair number, right? And how many of us have put in our blood, sweat, and sometimes literal tears into crafting the perfect strategy, syncing with engineers or creatives to set up the perfect feature or campaign, and then painstakingly collecting the data over weeks or months, and then finally analyzing the data, only to find that your strategy has been completely ineffective, or worse, harmful. That's terrible, right? So many of us would consider this a failed experiment. But in this talk, I'm hoping to convince you that we should not be afraid of failed experiments, and they, should, they can actually be extremely beneficial. And conversely, some apparent wins can actually lead us to false conclusions, and therefore detrimental effects. So first, let me give you a short intro on what I do. I'm part of a small team of data scientists at Uber who help other teams design and run experiments. And we all come from an academic research background, so we borrow best practices from academia and apply them within Uber. However, academia has a serious bias, and that bias is towards significant results. In other words, any experiment that yields a p-value of less than 0.05 is considered a win. So in academia, this number has an almost religious significance, right? So we pray to the research gods that we get a p-value of less than 0.05 so that we can publish our papers, you know, graduate, get tenure. And similarly in industry, no one sets up an experiment hoping we will fail. We hope to get p less than 0.05 so that we can tell our bosses a nice story that, you know, we tested this strategy and it worked. Conversely, if our test yields anything with a p-value of more than 0.05, usually this is labeled a fail. So what happens generally to strategies that don't result in a significant effect? Usually these results are swept under the rug and never spoken of again, as if there's something to be ashamed of. And this number, 0.05, is so ingrained in the stats universe that sometimes we forget that it's a completely arbitrary cutoff. In fact, this may not be the threshold for much longer. If you're following stats news, earlier this year, there was a proposal to change the threshold from 0.05 to 0.005. So when this paper was released online, it was as if you could almost hear like all the grad students of the world like crying out in terror together because now they're never going to graduate, right? And thank God I graduated before this happened. <laughs> yeah, so we celebrate when we get P less than 0.05 or 0.005, but sometimes these so-called wins can actually be failures in disguise leading us to false conclusions, and then further leading to detrimental outcomes. So in the first part of my talk, I'll go over some common experimentation pitfalls that lead us to these false conclusions. And in the following part, I'll talk about some best practices that we can follow to overcome these pitfalls and ensure that our experiment results are useful regardless of the outcome. So first, let's go over some common pitfalls that can lead us to false conclusions. Most of the factors I'm going to cover today are related to how we set up our experiments. The first one I'm going to talk about is bias sampling, sometimes known as cherry picking. So ideally, when we study a population, we want to ensure that we're selecting randomly from it so that our sample is representative of the population and doesn't differ in any systematic way. Sadly, academia again is a source of another cautionary tale about bias. And in this case, most academic studies run on human participants tend to have samples that consist mostly of weird people. In other words, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So why does this happen? Academic studies are run at universities, and the most convenient sample available to them are their students, who happen to be these weird people. And about 80% of study participants in, in academia fall into this weird group which is not very representative of humankind, considering that they only make up 12% of the human population. Okay, besides non-random sampling, another pitfall is non-random assignment to treatment and control groups. So again, when we're assigning people to treatment and control groups, we want to do so randomly so that there are no systematic differences between the treatment and control groups. And this is because if we observe an effect of the treatment, we want to be confident that this is due to the treatment and not due to any underlying differences between the treatment and control groups. 
So excuse my gratuitous use of fruit analogies, but in this case, we want to be comparing apples to apples. Okay, so some of the methods we use to assign people to treatment and control groups can actually lead to bias. Often, it's tempting to use the most convenient means possible to assign people to the treatment group. So for example, if I were testing a flu vaccine on campus, the easiest way for me to assign people to the treatment group would be to give the flu vaccine to everyone who came into the health center to receive the vaccine, and then compare them to everyone who didn't come into the health center as my control group. However, this introduces bias, because the people who come into the health center for the vaccine may be more concerned about their health in general, so, or, or they may differ in other meaningful ways from the control group. So this would not be a fair comparison. At other times, the features we choose to achieve random assignment may seem random, but they aren't. For example, sometimes we may use like email, phone numbers, or names to assign people to treatment and control group. For example, we can sort everyone's name alphabetically and assign everyone with names beginning from A to M to the treatment group, and then everyone else can be in the control group. And this seems innocent enough, right? However, you guess it, names are not random. So many things affect names, like culture, what decade it is, or even what season of Game of Thrones is on, right? So it's quite easy to accidentally introduce differences in our groups. And even if we've achieved random assignment and random selection, there are other ways for confounding variables to sneak into our experiment design. One common way for this to happen is called opt-in bias, or the very closely related non-compliance bias. So sometimes when we assign people to the treatment, they have a choice of whether or not to opt in or comply with our treatment. So take, for example, if we were running an email experiment. We send an email to the treatment group, and we don't send an email to the control group. Only some people are going to open this email, and others won't. So who should we include in the analysis? One common way I've seen of analyzing this kind of experiment is to compare everyone in the treatment group who opened the email against everyone in the control group. However, by excluding the people who did not open the email, we've introduced bias, because the people who don't open the email differ in meaningful ways from the people who did open the email. For example, the email openers may already be more engaged with your topic or brand, or they, be more they might be more tech savvy or more likely to open the email for other reasons. So again, this would not be a fair comparison. So there are plenty of ways for confounding variables to occur, and I'll talk about ways to deal with these pitfalls later. So let's move on to another topic, sample size. How many people should we include in our experiments? In this case, we face a kind of Goldilocks type situation. Usually, the problem we have with respect to sample size is that sample sizes are too small. We need a sufficiently large sample to have enough statistical power. In other words, the power to detect an effect if it's actually there. If we don't observe a significant effect, we also want to be confident that it's because there really was no result, as opposed to the situation where we just didn't have enough statistical power to detect a real effect. Secondly, we also want enough people in our, in our sample to have enough reliability. So if we do see a significant effect, we want to be confident that if we apply the treatment again, we will see the effect again. And this is very important if we are going to base our decision on whether or not to roll out a feature or campaign based on this experiment result. So one simple solution to avoid having too small of a sample size is to make our sample size extremely large. However, this comes with its own set of drawbacks. First of all, it can get really expensive. So usually treatments aren't free, and if we throw everyone in our population into the treatment group, these costs add up and the experiment could get very expensive. Secondly, unintended harmful effects are far reaching. If we've exposed many people in the treatment and the effect of our treatment is actually harmful, then we would have accidentally exposed more people to this condition than necessary. Okay, and sometimes it's important for uh, some experiments that the subjects have not been included in a previous version of the experiment before. Again, if we've thrown everyone into the treatment group, we would not have left any naive subjects for people in future iterations of this experiment. And this last one is a little tricky. So even small effects will show up as significant if we have a very large sample size. So this is kind of strange. Like We want to see significant effects, right? So what is the problem with this? So 
going back to the flu vaccine example, if we discover an effect of the flu vaccine where we've significantly reduced the uh, chances of getting the flu by 50%, that's great. But what if this effect was only a 5% reduction or a 1% reduction or you know, a 0.1% reduction? I think you get my point. Sometimes the magnitude of the effect, even though the result is significant, the magnitude is so small as to be meaningless or not very impactful at all. Okay, so this next one's my favorite p-hacking or data phishing. Let me tell you how to get significant results every time, guaranteed. If at first you don't succeed, you can keep running the experiment till it's significant, or you can check occasionally and stop if or when you get a significant result. If that doesn't work, you can segment by gender, city, life cycle, week, age, you know, you can get creative, or you can test with different metrics, exclude outliers, add covariates, and so on. You know, you can get creative. So in case you didn't catch that, I'm joking, don't do this. <laughs> okay, so why is it bad to run many, many experiments until you get a significant result? There's a famous comic from XKCD that illustrates why this is a problem. And I'm sure many of you have seen this, right? But uh, has anyone not seen this? Okay, for, for the two of you who haven't seen this, this is what happens in the comic. So, so someone has a hypothesis that jelly beans cause acne. So they run an experiment and they find no significant correlation between jelly beans and acne. But someone further hypothesizes that maybe it's only a certain color that causes acne. So they run 20 tests, one for each color, and they find a significant correla correlation between one color of jelly bean and acne. And they happily conclude that green jelly beans cause acne. So, this is a problem because every time we run a test, there's a certain chance of getting a significant result completely by chance. And the more tests we run, the higher the, the probability of getting at least one false positive becomes. Okay, so sometimes people do these things that I've just talked about, and we celebrate when we get P less than 0 0.05. It makes our CV look good, we can tell a good story to our bosses, or you know, if we're in school, we can publish a paper and graduate and get tenure. But in reality, we're wasting time, money, and effort by validating strategies that are completely ineffective or maybe harmful. So stats aside, I wanted to mention a whole different type of problem, which is not testing at all. So some people genuinely don't know the importance of you know, A-B testing or experimentation, and some others have complete faith in their intuition and like, believe that you know, whatever they create will be correct and work. At other times, it actually does require way too much effort to set up a complete randomized control trial. And that's completely forgivable because we need to balance business needs with uh, you know, statistical best practices. But at other times, some people don't test because they're afraid that the test will reveal that their strategy was ineffective. So after all, you can't have a failed experiment if you don't run an experiment at all. But to address this last point, in this final section, I'm going to talk about why we should not be afraid of failed experiments. Failed experiments can actually be very useful in avoiding ineffective or even harmful effects. However, for our failed experiments to be useful, or for actually any experiments to be useful, we need to first set up our experiments according to stati statistical best practices so that we can trust our results and draw accurate conclusions. More importantly, we should also adopt the right company culture and process that encourages the reporting of all experiment results, even the null or harmful results. So on the stat side, I'm going to start with random sampling. To recap, we want to sample randomly from our population so that the sample is representative of the population and doesn't differ in any meaningful ways. Sometimes this is very hard to do or impossible, and again, we need to balance best practices with business needs and efficiency. And that's fine. In these cases, we just need to make sure that we only generalize our conclusions to the groups that we actually concluded, uh, actually included. So going back to the weird example, we, should, we need to be careful about not generalizing these findings to other cultures or socioeconomic groups. Secondly, we want random assignment to treatment and control groups, such that there are no systematic differences between the two groups. To achieve this, 
we need to think about how we're randomly assigning people to each group so that we don't in accidentally introduce bias. So instead of using properties like name, email, and phone numbers that vary systematically between individuals, we can use things like UUIDs, universally unique identifiers, or random number generators, which as their name implies, are truly random. To address the opt-in bias problem that we talked about just now, remember that we were saying that one possibly biased way to run this analysis is to compare only the people who opened the email against the entire control group. However, this is biased because we're excluding people who are less likely to open your emails for whatever reason. To achieve a more fair test, an alternative way to run this analysis is to include everyone in the treatment group and compare them against everyone in the control group. This is a more conservative test that takes into account the real world situation where the effect of your email campaign may be dampened because some people will not open your email. A second alternative is to send a control email to the control group as well and only compare the email openers in both groups against each other. This will control for different levels of engagement or tech savviness or other reasons why some people may open the email more so than others. An analogy here is giving a treatment group a drug and the control a placebo, and some will comply while others will not. So we only compare the compliers against each other. Next up, how do we control for false positives when we're running a large number of tests? To keep the false positive rate under control, we need to do something called correcting for multiple comparisons. One of the simplest methods of this is called Bonferroni correction where we divide the original p-value threshold by the number of tests we're running and use the resulting number as our new p-value threshold. So for the XKCD comic example, where we ran 20 tests, all we would do here is divide the p-value threshold of 0.05 by 20 to get a new p-value threshold of 0.0025. So if the p-value for the link between the green jelly beans and acne was 0.01, under the old p-value threshold, we would have concluded that this correlation was significant. But under the new p-value threshold of 0.0025, which is stricter, we would reject this correlation as non-significant. So with respect to sample size, how do we know how many people to include in the experiment so that we have sufficient power and reliability without throwing everyone in the population into this experiment? To find the optimal number of people to include, there are formulae we can use to calculate the appropriate sample size, given the expected effect size and the desired level of power. So the details of these formulae are outside the scope of this talk, but once we have calculated the sample size, we should ideally not peek at the results until we have collected enough data to reach this ideal sample size. In other words, we should only run the analysis when we have finished uh, co collecting all our data, so that we're not tempted to end the experiment early if we just happen to observe a significant effect halfway. But we're human, and in case we're tempted to cheat, there are several more measures we can do to control for this. So the first is to list our hypotheses beforehand. This discourages p-hacking, and the litmus test for knowing whether or not we should include a hypothesis in our list is to ask ourselves if there's a reason to believe the effect exists at all. So for example, if we are segmenting by gender, there should be an underlying theoretical reason to believe that males and females will be behave differently or will react to the treatment in different ways. The second part of this is that for each hypothesis we list, the next step is to share the results regardless of the outcome. This is so that everyone in the organization can learn from both our successes and failures and also avoid duplicating your efforts. Okay, another way to control for temptation to cheat is to rope in unbiased analysts who can perform the analysis without any vested interest in the outcome. So these people can act as a neutral third party who can run the analysis in an unbiased way. Another way we can do this is to set up a peer review system so our fellow analysts and data scientists can look over our planned analysis and keep us honest. Okay, lastly, and most importantly, we need to create a culture that supports seeking the truth and not one that re rewards significant results. To do this, we need to encourage or even reward the reporting of null or harmful effects. 
And we can do this by reframing how we think and talk about non-significant results. So instead of saying that our strategy failed, we can instead recognize that we dodged a bullet. What negative effects did we avoid by testing first? And how many harmful, how many dollars and like hours of effort did we save by not rolling out a strategy that was ineffective or even harmful? Secondly, we can use the results of our experiments to find out how we can improve the next version of our strategy. So by adopting an approach of testing our strategies after we design and build them, and using the results of this test, whether or not they were successful or failed, to inform the next version of our test, we can iteratively improve our strategy over time instead of relying on gut feel. So my primary school Mandarin teacher is going to be very proud of me because I'm going to end off with a proverb. Failure is the mother of success. I know it's a little cheesy, but I think this captures very well the attitude that I hope teams will adopt. Because if we can first of all adopt statistical best practices and know that we can trust our results and conclusions, and on top of that, also adopt a culture that celebrates failures, we can not only ensure that our so-called failures are regarded as wins in and of themselves, but can also lead us to future bigger wins. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, this one over there. So uh, you just want an example of like kinds of things we A-B test? Sure, yeah. So um, at Uber, we work with a large number of groups. And um, one of the examples from real life was actually the email example. So um, some groups tend to run experiments by themselves and not uh, consult any like, analysts or data scientists. And um, there are certain things that they do that uh, you know seem intuitive. For example, the, the email campaign is one of them. Uh, we A-B test a lot of things, uh, like channel, comms, uh, different like behavioral science strategies and so on. And uh, we encourage teams to like, you know, consult us to design the experiment correctly. Right, yes, yes. Um, but oftentimes when they do it themselves, uh, they fall into the, the common pitfalls that I listed here. Yeah, so multiple tests um, lead us to this like, false positive problem, right? There's several different methods of controlling the false positive rate, and one of them I listed was the Bonferroni correction. However, there's, um, there's multiple different ways to control for you know, a false discovery rate um, or family-wise error rate. Uh, there's, there's a lot of like, recommended methods online. So if you Google like, false discovery rate or um, false family-wise error rate, there's many like, different Oh, I see. No. <laughs> so uh, both. First of all, we uh, encourage that people list hypotheses, and um, we are generally we tra generally try to be quite strict with the kind of hypotheses we um, test at all. So this, first of all, controls the number, the total number of tests that we run. And secondly, if we really, really do have to run multiple tests, then at the end of the day, we also run a Bonferroni correction. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you so much. <laughs>